No, you stopped it. Okay. Okay, welcome back to our Thursday afternoon session. Um, I have not a lot to say, only that uh, Paolo Monella put on his shirt <laughs> for this session, so he will guide you and introduce you to uh, the IIIF standard, so uh, an, a standard that is uh, um, applied uh, increasingly by research and archives, uh, research libraries and archives, uh, in order to enable uh, scholars or creators of uh, scholarly resources to uh, include images uh, from their uh, from their uh, facsimiles um, uh, into uh, any resource. Uh, as long as you follow this particular standard, so that's a really step forward in in uh, a world uh, where uh, the digital resources are distributed and people take care of uh, those research, uh, resources that they are the most uh, competent uh, people and institutions, in this case, uh, the manuscripts themselves. So, Paolo. Uh, Paolo is a visiting scholar at, at our center, so we are very glad to have him as a, as a visiting scholar with us uh, and is originally from the University of Palermo. And that's enough for presentation. Thank you very much. No. We keep it all. We have kept it always short. I yeah, mean, I, I should say you are working on a universal uh, uh, transcription model uh, um, to uh, so also to push forward the world of uh, the semantic web and linked open data in order to enable uh, the connection between different levels and modes of transcribing text. So really central also for ourselves. But that's not your talk today. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I mean, my project in these words sounds very, very, very interesting. Thanks yeah. a lot. Uh, well, after you said I'm wearing a shirt, that's the exceptional <laughs> thing of today that should really have been said. Okay, so everyone, welcome to the workshop on Triple IF. Uh, I am pasting in the in the chat of this uh, of this Google Meet two links: the materials and the slides. Please open the slides and keep them open in a different tab or window, so you can follow at some point uh, with me along. The slides just because the slides include some links that we will use for some very sh little exercises to get some hands-on experience on this uh, protocol that i'm going to talk about which is trip if so i'll give you a minute to click on the slides so keep the slides on the tab and the video on another tab so when i speak mostly nonsense then you will watch the video but when i ask you to go to the slides okay i guess you all open the slides by now now I'm uh, sharing my screen, um, full screen, allow, okay. A minute, can you see my screen? Oh, not you. Can you see my screen now? Yes. yes. Good. So these are the, the slides, a short notation. Uh, as you see, to navigate the slides, you go with those arrows, right and left. And uh, on top, on the address bar, you can see a number, number one, number two, Right, so when I refer to slide number three, that's basically the slide that ends with me, so you can so you can join me. Okay, so what I'm going to talk to you about is linking text and image. So we have a digital edition, which is a transcription of a primary source, for example. Uh, so we have text in TI, in TI XML. Um, I want to link that transcription or that text to images. What kind of images? Normally we link them to images of the manuscript that I'm using or uh, of a papyrus or of, a, or of an inscription, an early book, etc. That's the kind of images we're talking about. Triple IF is a new protocol born in the, in the early 10s uh, to facilitate this communication. Okay, let's get this started. Uh, slide number one, what I want to achieve is this. Eventually, in the visualization, I want to have my transcription on one side. Can you see my cursor, the arrow that's moving? Yes, we do. Yes, you can. Okay, so over here you have your transcription, your text, and over here you have the image. That's what we want to achieve eventually. Um, first point, let's link our TI digital edition to a local image. Imagine I, have imagine I have downloaded the photo of a page of a manuscript into my uh, computer. This gets all eventually ends up in a server, in a, in a web server, because I'm publishing my edition online. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, how do you encode the connection between TI and the local image? That's a simple case. Um, we're on slide number three. 
Now I go down with the arrow to slide three slash one. Okay. So um, I have a local image of page 218 recto JPEG. I put it in the same folder in which I have my TIXML file. So the TI code is as simple as that. PB is the page beginning representing the, the page in my TI transcription. I put a new, the simplest way is putting a new element that's a new attribute that's fax, like faximal image. There are more complex approaches, but I'm just showing you the simplest one. Um, so I say that there is a facsimile, an image of this page break, and it is file 218r.jpg. It's in the same folder. This is all in the encoding. Then the visualization software will go get the image and possibly show it side by side <clears throat> uh, in front of my transcription. Uh, if the image is not, it may be, the image may be local, but in its image is subfolder. So in my in the folder of my digital edition, I have XML files and I have a subfolder which is images and the JPEG image is inside. And, uh, and in this case, um, I have images slash um, and the name of the file. This is the simplest approach. This approach over here seems different, seems different but uh, wait, wait a minute. it seems different, but it's pretty much the same thing. I am as as a value of the facsimile of the facsimile um, attribute. I am pointing to uh, an image which is online. So the facsimile uh, image attribute points to this uh, long URL, which, however, points to an actual JPEG file. So this is the traditional approach. Uh, in terms of visualization, one uh, quite uh, sophisticated software for the visualization is EVT, Edition Visualization Technology, uh, which, as I said, uh, it shows you the image side by side vis-a-vis. -vis. Uh, a simpler way, a simpler approach that we will probably use during workshop or and to, on, possibly also tomorrow morning is using an online software, an online uh, system such as Ox Garage or an XSLT transformation. This is what we're going to do tomorrow in the visualization session. So you use an XSLT file, which transforms your uh, XML into HTML. HTML can be visualized. And the result is something like this. So you have uh, a visualization of your text and a simple link. You click on the link and you see the, uh, and you see the image the image of the manuscript. Um, however, there's an issue. The issue is that libraries um, claim that they have copyright over photos of manuscript pages written 1,000 years ago with text composed 2,000 years ago. So um, I, that's debatable, and I have a different opinion on this. But apparently, if you don't want to go through a lawsuit with the libraries, uh, uh, you need to get permission to use those images. For instance, in my own edition of Ursus Beneventanus, I got high-resolution images from a library to use them to create my edition. But after I created my edition, I asked whether I could put those images online, uh, available to everybody, vis-a-vis -vis the translation. And that requires a special trans um, permission from the library. Uh, a simple, a simple solution of this is TripleIF. Uh, TripleIF uh, is a technology, a framework in, for uh, a solution for which images stay on their server. For instance, the manuscript of the Marco Polo library, we're, of the Marco Polo text we're working on during this uh, uh, this uh, summer camp, uh, that manuscript is the, in the Bodleian library. So the Bodleian library makes a photo of the manuscript. Uh, those images stay on the server. It's a triple IF server, and they may be integrated over the internet in distributed editions, like Franz Fischer showed in the introduction of this trend. Our editions should become more like a web. So you take care of the transcriptions, images stay there in the Bodilian library, and you take them through a language, communication language, such as triple IF. Triple IF is a protocol. In fact, it's not a protocol, it's a framework. It's something more than a protocol. Basically, it's a language shared between computers so that the Boolean library, for example, can serve me, give me the images that I need with metadata on those images. For instance, the image of, of page 218R has metadata attached that says, this is page 218R. This has this size, this quality, this resolution, etc.
Um, okay, so what does IIIF stand for? International Image Interoperability Framework. That's why it's a framework, not a protocol. Okay, so first thing we should do, please go to the slides, slide number nine. I'm, I'm pasting, copy pasting the link in the chat. So in the chat over here, you have, uh, you have the, the link you can click on. So the very first thing, the simplest thing I can do uh, with IIIF is that the Bodleian library puts the manuscripts online and I can view them online with my browser. So please click on the, on the, on the link, on the blue link, and tell me what you see, either in the chat or... No, that's a simple, that's a simple one, just click on it, <laughs> see what happens. Uh, I see uh, the digitalization of the manuscript with um, on the left bar uh, with the three texts uh, exactly, that are exactly. and all the try and use those right. Try and use those arrows right and left of the thumbnails. Navigate a little bit. Yeah. So what we have is a collection of images in the Bodleian Library. If you're watching the video right now, you see that it's. The, 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 the address bar is triplef.bodleian.oxford, etc. So these images stay there. I can just see them. I can zoom. If you click on Le Livre du Grand Cam left, it's like a table of contents, it will take you to the page in which our text starts. This is the text that we have been transcribing in the last days during workshops. Si commence Le Livre du Grand Cam, qui parole de la, etc., etc. Okay, now I'm viewing it. That's the simplest thing. Let's move to slide number 10. What's in there for me as a philologist? What's, um, IIIF is based uh, on some key concepts. Two key concepts are canvas over here and collection over here. A canvas is more or less a rectangle such as this, an empty rectangle, like an actual canvas I can paint on. So a canvas is a space upon which I can put something. Typically, on that rectangle, which in the case of philology normally represents a manuscript page, but if I am the museum of the, Lou the Louvre Museum of Paris, of Paris, that pa the canvas could be the actual canvas of, uh, of the Mona Lisa. Uh, so, upon that canvas, I can attach one or more images. The second key concept is collection. Collection is a collection of canvases. In our case, uh, all the pages of a manuscript. If you go down, sl slide 10 slash 1, you see that one canvas can have more than one image. One canvas may include many images, example, given new photos of the same manuscript. Um, it's happened to me to see a manuscript uh, collection, a IIIF collection of a manuscript that had a set of images, old images taken from microfilms, and a new set of images uh, taken afterwards. So each canvas had two different images, old photo, new photo. Uh, another, in another case, new photos were taken after the manuscript restoration. So the canvas, the rectangle is the same, but the photos are different and they represent different aspects. And with Alberto Campagnolo today, we have seen that we have, may have different photos of the same page because they're taken with advanced imaging. So we have a regular photo, then we have multi-spectral imaging, then we have X-ray, all images insisting on the same canvas. Okay, so canvas is for page in our case, but think of this in an abstract way. A canvas may have different images. We have different photos of the same page. Also, on a canvas, I can attach annotations or transcriptions, but this is not something we're covering in detail today. What's important about JSON metadata is, um, is that uh, each images, so images, okay, I can publish the images of a manuscript on a web page, on a blog as regular files. The diff one of the differences here is that IIIF allows me to serve images with metadata. So JSON metadata file, I'm on slide 11. Well, please go to slide uh, 11 slash one. I'm pasting the link because now I'll ask you to click on those metadata file. So it's in the chat, 11 slash one. All right, you should see a list, a bullet point, manifest canvas image. So the, please click on the first link, manifest. Do you see?
nonsense. Thousands of lines of code. <laughs> of code. And that's, in fact, you, you were expecting to see an image. You haven't seen an image, you're seeing code. This code is in a, in a language, it's called, uh, in a format, it's called JSON. See? Well, over here, it's dot JSON. So JSON is uh, um, is a way to uh, put to to encode structured data and information. So, for example, the way you're visualizing this JSON file, okay, if you if you click on that in a laborat, you see what it really looks like. It looks even worse. But if you click on JSON, you see that uh, those triangles. Do you see those triangles here? If you click on one of those triangles, you can navigate the file. So, what's this? This is the metadata file in JSON format for the whole collection of this Bodleian manuscript. In fact, if you click on sequences and then click on zero, and then click on canvases, you see that there is a list of canvases. So this, this file has a number, a lot of information, such as the information about the manuscript. This is Bodleian Library Manuscript 264. Uh, date, date in which, uh, with the navigation date, the attribution, the copyright, etc., etc., but it also has a list of canvases, so a list of pages. And if you scroll down this list, we have hundreds and 575 pages. And each page has information. So this is folio 181R with the, its image, its default image has this width and this height, etc. Let's go back to the slide. If you click on Canvas, here is another metadata file with information on that specific canvas. Let's say that page. In fact, the label is Folio 218R. If you click on Image, we say that one canvas may have many images. One page may have, may have different photos, images attached to it. So if you click on Image, you have yet another metadata file. And this metadata file has information on the specific image or images. Uh, well, no, on the specific image, on one specific image photo of that manuscript page. For example, here down it says that the server has the same image available in color, in gray, in black and white, right? So this is all metadata about the image. But if, if you click on the last link, image file, please do. The last bullet point, image file, the one that ends with full, full, zero default. Click on it. And that's where you get the actual image. If you notice the address in your browser, the address doesn't end in JSON anymore. All other addresses ended with .json, .json, .json. But this one doesn't end in .json anymore. What you're seeing right now is an actual is an actual image. In fact, if you click, if you hit Control S in your computer or Save As, right click, Save Image As, you can actually save this image. All I'm saying is that in this case, the server is giving us the actual image. Please notice one thing. Go to slide 11, two, or go back to the video. Okay, I'm on slide 11, two. This is the URL of the JSON metadata file on that image. This is the URL of the actual image. What's the difference? They're identical, but this one ends with info.json because it's a JSON file, metadata. This one ends with those strange terms, full, full, zero, default. And now we're going to talk about this. So if you substitute the info.json URL with this full, full, zero, default, you get to the actual image. Who says so? So how do I know that I have to write full, full, zero, default? It's this specific, so to speak, language that tells me so, the IIIF language. It's, uh, it's part of the IIIF framework. Okay, slide 12. The image API, which is, uh, in simpler words, the image functions, the image manipulation functions, uh, is one of the key features of IIIF. IIIF has functions, an API, to manipulate the whole collection and functions to manipulate individual images. The functions for to, to manipulate individual images are called image API. Okay, um, if you click, go to slide 12, I'm pasting and copy it to the to the chat, go to slide, slide number 12, and click on the full, full, zero default, right? You have the full image. 
Now, do a little experiment with me. Go to the address bar of your browser up here, right? HTTPS slash slash that one. Instead of the first full, full is repeated twice. Instead of the first full, please write 2000, comma, 2000, comma, 2000, comma, 2000, four times. Okay, Let's see what happens. I'm pasting this in the in the chat. Two thousand, two thousand, two thousand, four times. What happens? Does anybody want to tell me whether it worked out or not? Okay, I'm doing it in the video. Instead of the first full over here, I'm writing two thousand. Comma, 2000, comma, 2000, comma, 2000. This is what happens to me in the video. Has it happened to you? Yeah, it appears a yes. particular yes. of the region, image. Right? Mm -hmm. So what we have done is that we have spoken with the Bodleian library in Oxford server. We haven't spoken English or Italian. We have spoken IIIF. So this is metaphorically a language, a formal way to communicate with the server. What's interesting, and what did I ask? I asked, I want this image, the one that ends with BC3, but not full. I only want those coordinates. So I have cropped the image, but the cropping hasn't happened in my computer. I communicated with Oxford and the cropping, the cropping, the cutting out of, a, of this square happened on the computer of Oxford and the server, the computer of Oxford served me only a specific version of the email, which of the image, which is cropped. If I change this full, for example, instead of full, write the second full, go to the second full, replace it with, replace it with 50 comma, 50 or 50 comma 50. 50 comma 50. Okay. So I have the same thing, smaller. So by manipulating the URL, I'm communicating with the server through the IIIF image functions, image API. So I'm asking a specific cropping, a specific region, a specific size, a specific color. Instead of default, I can write, for instance, bitonal, bitonal, bitonal. That's easier to do. Instead of default, I write bitonal. I'm asking for a black and white version of the same image. So the good thing about this is this. I create my own scholarly edition. I don't, I don't care about images. Images stay in Oxford. They keep their copyright if they want it. And they serve me the image a la carte as I want this, as I want them. So if we go back to the video, this is called image API. I can resize, crop, change the, quali the quality, the color, or rotate an image. An image, th any, a funny thing to do, there's a little zero at the end. In, instead of zero, write 90, and the image is rotated. Um, so, rotation, quality, etc. Now, let's link our D TI digital edition to a triple IF image. So, I have created my transcription of the Marco Polo manuscript. I want to link it not to a local image. Or and not to a simple static JPEG file. I want to link it to a triple IF image, so I have more flexibility. Um, there are many ways to do this. And by the way, keep in mind that this is cutting edge technology, so to speak, for the simple reason that triple IF came along at the beginning of the tens, uh, 2011, 2012, etc. Uh, it's still being developed, and it's above all, it's still being uh, applied. So the TIXML digital philology community has not just yet elaborated the standard uh, standard get guidelines for the integration of TIXML with IIIF. So what we're doing right now is brand new. For instance, you could ask, you could wonder, does my library have uh, IIIF images or not? Well, we don't know. Some libraries do, do already, some libraries don't. For instance, in Italy, there's only one library, the Ambrosiana Library in Milan, that has a IIIF server. So you can access those images via the IIIF framework. And there is another library that's in the Italian peninsula, but that's not technically the Italian Republic. It's the Vatican Library. And that's good news because the Vatican Library has so many manuscripts. However, as I said, what I'm proposing to you right now is just, so to speak, experimental ways to connect your image with IIIF. Okay, let's start. 
I want to connect my edition. I am doing a transcription of a, manu of a manuscript. I want to connect my transcription with the whole manifest, with the whole collection of images in the Bodleian Library. I think that the most reasonable, reasonable thing to do is go into the manuscript description uh, element in the TI header. In this element, I describe the, some features of the manuscript. You have uh, seen uh, the presentation of, uh, if you have seen the presentation by Alberto Campagnolo uh, this morning, he's been talking about the manuscript description uh, element. Uh, I can add the, a facsimile attribute to the manuscript description. However, in this case, I would be pointing, this would be a little bit, bit of a tag abuse because it doesn't point to an image, it points to the metadata of the image. Do you recognize this link? Obviously not, but see, manifest. In fact, this is the manifest of the whole manuscript, of the whole collection of pages of photos. So I can link to it. What, would, what will the so visualization software do with this link? Probably not much today. And uh, I think that it's our it's our task in the next years. It's your task in the digital editions that you are going to develop to develop software that will make use of this integration. Because today, visualization softwares are at odds with Triple EF. Okay, the simplest integration between TI and a Triple EF image is linking a page of transcription to the photo of a whole page. That's the simplest one. I can do this theoretically in many ways. Again, I have a PB element, as I said, which means page beginning, and uh, I have uh, the number of the page beginning in my transcription. I add an attribute which points to the facsimile, which points to what? In this case, I'm pointing to the canvas JSON metadata file, which is reasonable because what I mean is the canvas, the page, not the specific image. Now, the way to do this is pointing to the info JSON the specific info JSON metadata file of that of that info, of that image. The third way, which is the one that's most likely to work if you do it today, is linking is look at here. Do you remember full full zero default? This URL is the URL that shows you the actual image. If I copy this and paste it, I get the image. So if you do this way, so if you point to the URL, triple IF URL that points to the spe a specific version of the image, full size, not cropped, full color, zero rotation, etc. Then your visualization software is most likely to retrieve the actual image, image and to work. I made the example of this software, that's the uh, edition visualization software. Version two of this software um, by Rossello, Roberto Rosselli and Turk and his team is based on a visual, visualizer that's called uh, OpenSea Dragon. Now, if you use that software today and you put in your edition this kind of, uh, of source code, so you point to the full, full, zero default URL, then it will work. It will actually show you the image. A more sophisticated approach is what if I want to to link to a region of the image. And that's part of the potential of IIIF. I can define a rectangle in the image. These coordinates point to the first line of the text. See commands le livre du grand camp qui parole de la grande Arménie et Perse. So one way to do this, there are many ways we could do this. One way could be having a line break. You already have this in your TI transcription. But you add this facsimile that points to an image, so to speak, but it doesn't point to the full image. Look, it points to the 500, 3550, etc. It points to a specific rectangle of, of the work. Uh, so, just to make you one example, if you use trip, if you use EVT, the Edition Visualization Technology Software, and you put software and you put source code like this, EVT does not recognize it. It is a challenge to use IIIF today with uh, with TI, but in any case, if you get a lot of money with a ERC project, which is my wish for you, and you prepare a big edition of a text or a series of texts, you will probably hire a digital humanist who will probably develop software that will handle this, will handle IIIF references that are slightly more complex than a whole than a whole image. This is a little bit complex because it's a cropped image. For instance, Tiziana Mancinelli who spoke yesterday about uh, linked open data has in fact created a, um, 
has in fact created a, a prototype of a, of a software that helps you out with connecting TEI and IIIF. In the last slide that we see at the end, slide number 30, you see Tiziana Mancinelli, Bologna 2020, you have links to, um, to her work, to her slides on this topic, and she is one of the, of the people who are working on developing software for this kind of integration. This is the second line of the same rubric, the Tartare Dind. You see the coordinates are different. So this links to this to a rectangle, this links to another rectangle. The last thing I want to talk to you about, so we finish in time, hopefully, is um, I can uh, I can link from TI, there is a there is a, an element that's called figure um, that marks in the text that it's at that point of the text, there is a photo, a drawing, a table, a graphical element, a figure. Uh, in this case, see, I have cropped a rectangle in that page that corresponds to that beautiful drawing of the of the city of Venice. Um, so, if you put software, if you put source code such as this in your uh, in your edition, so figure, close figure graphic URL, and you point to that rectangle, okay, as you see, this is also a rectangle, then, um, and since this is, uh, this, since this is, a, um, okay, this is an image eventually, so if, if I paste and copy this URL to my, to my browser over here, my browser returns an actual image that I can save as a JPEG file. So, uh, again, depending on the visualization software you are using, um, chances are, <laughs> if, if you create your software well, that the, the user can be linked, can be can be can click, um, and go with the, with their browser, or, or simply view uh, this beautiful uh, this beautiful picture uh, that's in that's in the page. Okay, I think that's uh, that's enough for my presentation. Thank you very much. Ah, uh -huh, France, you didn't expect it to be so short. Huh? I've been doing rehearsals. Oh, no, really, I mean, you, you're the first person who managed to uh, uh, really stick to the time frame. So congratulations, not only for this uh, really instructive uh, uh, introduction, but also Ooh. for keeping the time limit. So congratulations. Everybody is happy. I'm sure there are questions. I, I have a, uh, I raised the first question. Uh, um, how do you get the numbers? So how do you get the coordinates you want? I think that's the most obvious question everybody wanted to ask. And that's a great question, but I mean, I myself do it by hand. And that's very funny because when I created those things, I did something like this. Okay, let's see what I get if I go like this. But there is a tool that Tiziana Mancinelli created to do this, to do exactly this. So if Tiziana is online, she might say something about it and possibly give the link. You, if you go to the last slide, you have those links. It's are you there? I think she's working on an article in parallel. <laughs> okay, then uh, then do this. Go to slide number thirty, uh, which I'm pointing. I'm, I'm I'm pasting in the chat right now. If you go to slide number thirty, uh, you see there there is a number of. Well, this is interesting to say. On slide number thirty, you see there are some learning resources. I think that those uh, workshops of 30 minutes can only give you an introduction, but it's good to give you a way to, you know, to start to continue learning. What's very useful here are the, is the, the basically the guidelines, the, what's it called, the specifications of the, of the software that's on the triple, that are on the triple F website. Anyway, going back to the slide number 30, if you click on Tiziana Mancinelli, Bologna 2020, she gave a much longer workshop, I think three or six hours. And one of the tools that she that she created, this one that she is developing right now, so that you draw the rectangle with your mouse and you get the coordinates. So since we are really on a cutting edge uh, technology, I would su simply suggest that you look for Tiziana Mancinelli online, drop her a line. And if you want to incorporate this in your project, you collaborate with her. And uh, yeah, we are working on these things right now. And not only that uh, software she developed will give you the coordinates that you are looking for, but also you can already uh, give a label to what you see or what you have been annotating. 
so uh, it, it's also a tool for annotation. So this is really, um, really extremely useful. Unfortunately, <laughs> she's working on that article. <laughs> yes, but Gaia Tomazzoli just pasted in the chat the link, the link to, to yeah, the tool that Tizian created. Documenti d'amore, it's an ERC project. That is why my colleague Antonio Montefusco was able to hire her and to really uh, keep her free from other duties to work on that particular tool. So that's uh, the best time you can get as a researcher to have really free time to dedicate yourself to develop a tool like this. So. There's, there's, a question. there's a question in, uh, in the, by Judita in the chat. You can also I'll read it with me. Okay, so Judith is saying, if I connect my edition to the whole manifest, which is the reasonable thing to do, uh, I should link any single IIIF default image to my edition? Yes. The point is that I did the same. I connected the manifest in my edition of Romualdus Salernitanus, a quite boring chronicle of the 12th century in Latin. Um, I linked uh, the manuscript description to the, to the manifest. But then after that, I also had to link each PB with each image at the state of the art today. But another um, another visiting uh, visiting scholar in the general sense of the of the Vedi page, which is Angelo Mario del Grosso, is also working on those things, and he's been working in collaboration with the EVT team, Edition Visualization Software, Roberto Rosselli del Turco, and he said because I presented a talk with Roberto Rosselli del Turco on these topics at the IUCD conference in January, and he's been mentioning to us that the latest, latest version of Open Sea Dragon, let me write it down, Open Sea, Open, Open Sea Dragon, is able to handle manifests. He mentioned it, but he didn't, never explained to us how you can integrate that version of Open Sea Dragon in EVT to make it work. So in other words, this is an open uh, field work. And another person you might want to contact is Roberto Rosselli del Turco from the EVT. He's very, he's a very open and collaborative person and, and they're very happy to develop new features. Thank you for that question. Another prominent uh, person uh, in, who was part of this IIIF consortium, which is an open consortium, so everyone is invited to uh, further develop this standard and framework, is uh, Jeffrey Witt, which I have uh, introduced. I have introduced this edition of uh, the, the Scholastic col uh, Collection uh, um, and the framework, uh, which is called Lombard Press, so where he also takes use of the IIIF standard to include the um, images of the respective text passages on each of the manuscript witnesses, which are delivered uh, by the research libraries or archives. So you might have will, will want to have a look at this. So this is, he also has produced a lot of uh, uh, English documentation about this framework and uh, how he takes use in his publication framework of this. And I'm very much hoping that also uh, Daniel Fusi is going to adopt uh, CATMUS, uh, so the, the, um, uh, his multiple purpose uh, addition framework also to make uh, people uh, able to include IIIF images into your edition or resource uh, that you are creating. Say, right, Daniele? Well, what about these plans? I, I don't want to push you. <laughs> Yeah, Catmus is an open system, so I just have to plan a module which is plugged into it, and maybe you are just going to select some parts of an image and uh, create uh, automatically the, <coughs> the code to link to IIIF in a so-called text layer, which points to the base layer, which is the text itself, and then we have a number of layers on it which represent apparatus, uh, tripod IF, uh, whatever. Oh, yes, Daniel Fusi, no problem. He is really uh, developing a very powerful uh, framework. Uh, and I'm glad that you also have triple IF standards included. Um, I have a question. 
Uh, what is um, preventing archives from adopting IIIF? For example, eCodices in Switzerland has IIIF, but the Bibliothèque Nationale de France has a lot of images in Gallica, but not IIIF. What is preventing them from adopting IIIF? Is it cost? Is it what? That's a good question to ask them. Thank you. Well, I, obviously, I can only say what I think. It looks to me like it needs a, a lot of, uh, of work and therefore cost. I know personally um, Fabio Cusimano, who's also from Palermo. Uh, he is uh, in charge of the digitization of the Biblioteca Ambrosiana uh, of Milan. So he's another Palermitan who went to work to Milan. No big, no good news. No, 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 no nothing new. But he's been in charge of this. He's been working for I guess, I don't know how much, but really long to get that. So it's an investment in infrastructure. Also, it's an infrastructure that's standard. Every library has a, that puts some manifests, on, some images online, has its own infrastructure and its own protocol, so to speak. But moving to a standard uh, protocol, which is more open and more interoperable, is good, but it definitely takes time because it means moving from a, one protocol to another. I think so one library could ask what's in there for me I mean why should I do that what what do I gain from that well there is the, the answer for us as scholars is clear we want open protocols so we can use different libraries different manuscripts we can have a new world of digital philology that's all connected and interoperable obviously this is a burden on libraries and we all know that time and money is an issue for anyone I don't know Frank, what you think of this yeah, it's important that uh, influential, important uh, libraries and archives take the lead. So, and everyone uh, doesn't want to get behind. So, and, uh, and I think that's happening right now. So, I think it will be more and more uh, uh, used and provided also by, by other libraries. So, national libraries, of course, have the lead by by nature, so to say. And so, Bibliothèque Nationale de France, I can't. I can think that uh, they will wait much longer to go forward into this direction. Smaller libraries, of course, there's a really an, an question of investment of uh, human and financial resources, but the, the big players definitely will go into this direction and also funding institutions more and more push into this direction. Yes, on that note, I'm, I'm speaking from England and the UK funding bodies. Um, I've been involved in previous project um, proposals and where we ask for money for digital images. Perhaps we could write in the proposal that we want the archive to produce triple F images if we have the money that follows. Yes, I don't know what you make of this, but this is a very general point that I'm very, very keen of doing. When we do such proposals, especially to the European Union or anyway to those institutions that claim to be for open science, we should make the case that we, okay, yeah, I already have a system to publish images. I'm asking for money to move to another system. What's the point? The point is that if we really want open science, we want open protocols. I'll keep, it, I'll keep this short, but it's an important point to make. Maybe another problem is specialists. Uh, for example, in Georgia, uh, we have very few specialists, uh, programmists and uh, digital scholars. And um, programmists mainly work in banks and uh, more um, uh, profitable places. And the digital humanities is not as popular as, as that to our city. Very true. I mean, a programmer, a programmer, a programmer's time must be paid for the for the the cost that, that's that's a market cost. Whereas a, a humanities researcher's time costs much less. But programmers have skills that they can use in the, in a real job. Absolutely true. <laughs> a real job. Uh, another argument, uh, just to reply to Fiona's question. Another argument for adopting IIIF may also be to uh, save admin costs when you are distributing uh, licenses for the images, for example. Because when people request images, there is quite an over, uh, overhead of administrative costs to issue licenses and you know, take the money and all that kind of thing. 
uh, which doesn't usually break even with what you're making. And if you have IIIF, the license is already integrated, so you don't need that administration. Excellent point. I also think that this separation of concerns is important. We take care of the text because that's our job, but someone else will take care of images that will be curated. But that's a scientific point, yeah, not an organizational point, just adding up on what you just said. Yeah, I think the overall uh, benefit of uh, promoting, applying, and further developing this standard is uh, pretty obvious to all sides. So it's, and I really believe this is just a question of time where we get, where this is the normal case. So, so hopefully. So I think it's a good, uh, good to end on an optimistic, positive note. Uh, and that's what we want to do now. Um, we will meet again, uh, everybody, tomorrow for our final session, which will be um, a little bit more open. So we will see how we will get them from our wonderful data to some presentations. So of course, we can't uh, uh, show you the full range of possibilities. You look at uh, editions that are already out there. I showed you the catalogs uh, in my introduction. Uh, we will show you just uh, uh, some principle how to get from code to presentation. Uh, this afternoon, there will be also a closed uh, exercise uh, with uh, Paolo uh, for the um, smaller group. But the exercise is also um, in the folder, Paolo, for everyone. In fact, in fact, the exercises are in the last slides of the presentation. So you can do those exercises on your own. They are quite well detailed, detailed explained. And you can email me. The last slide also has my contact page. So you can do your exercise on your own and send me the email of the results if something goes wrong. Excellent. OK, so uh, see you in five minutes or tomorrow morning. And then in the afternoon, we will have the uh, uh, closing keynote by Fabio Vital from Bologna, which will uh, be uh, just another highlight. Uh, so hope to see you there as well. Thanks.